Let's turn to Psalm 43. Big surprise, right? I've been stuck there for three weeks. Psalm 42, 43, and as I explained, Psalm 42 and 43 are actually one psalm. And they, uh, when the, during the translation to English, they were divided into two. But Psalm 42 and 43 are one psalm. And just some things to think about uh, as everyone's turning there. I wanted to just share some things that I feel like we need to pray for. <coughs> Obviously, this pandemic needs to be prayed for. Um, it's uh, causing many problems in our country. And uh, then all the unrest in our country also uh, really needs our prayers. I think of Romans 12, 21, when I, I think of our situation, and that is, do not be overcome, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, why do we say something like that would apply? Well, I think back, I always think of the story of David, when David fell into sin with Bathsheba, and the prophet Nathan came to him, and he said, David, he gave him a little parable. David, there was a man who took from his neighbor, who only had one, a man who had much, and he took one ewe lamb from his neighbor that they had as a pet, and he, he killed it and used it to have a party for his friends and David was angry and he was like you know this man is going to pay for his life and the prophet in a great act of courage I might add pointed to the king and said David you're the man and the blindness that is in each and every one of us is that we can have the best of intentions the best rationale and still have a blindness to something evil that is going on. And I think historically speaking, many times in revolutions when a government is overthrown and taken over by a new power, that the new, especially in the name of freedom, the new one becomes worse than a previous one. Why is that? Because we have and, and I have this, and I, I feel it rising up in me many times. We have the idea that there's a saying, you have to fight fire with fire, right? You come up against something evil, and you respond with more. Violence is met with more violence. And we see that before long, the new becomes worse than the old. And as a sensitive subject, and I'm certainly not gonna get political this morning, but you know the American Revolution, the story of that, of how our country began for freedom. It began for freedom because there were people who did not like the oppression of England. Our country began, began on the principle of freedom, yet in a short while, People were bought and sold and enslaved by the very people who were proclaiming freedom. So we see that there are blind spots and we have to seek the Lord in that we are not overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. That is where the true power of change in this world is is through the love of Jesus Christ and the good that is done in the world. The lasting change. It's incredible that the person that had the most effect in this world, Jesus Christ, never resorted to evil. I think of another positive, another positive example is Martin Luther. As he revolutionized the church, the Great Reformation. He did that with what? Declaring the Word of God and grace, the grace of God. He didn't resort to evil means. We need to see many things in our lives changed by good, and good is what? The glory of God. Just a thought. That's not what I'm even speaking on this morning. 
So bear with me on that. But that's something to pray about. We need much healing in our nation from the pandemic, from all the unrest. But there needs to be change also. Psalm 43, verses 3 and 4. Let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father. Lord, heal our land. Your word gives us a promise that if my people will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them. And I will heal their lands if we will seek his face and humbly pray. Lord, we humble ourselves before you this morning. Lord, reveal your word to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to read these two verses, Psalm 43, verses 3 and 4. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. So I wanted to look at this scripture this morning under the name, I would say, of being prepared. And what we really want to show in scripture is that we all need to be pre prepared as, as Christians. First Timothy, or I'm sorry, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. And that perfect doesn't mean, okay, I'm, I'm never going to make a mistake. You know, if I go out here and trip over a rock, I'm not going to fall down. Well, yeah, I will. I'm not going to be a perfect person, but I'm going to be complete in positional truth. I will be complete in Christ. God will view me as righteousness in Christ. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, or completely equipped is what that means. Completely equipped unto all good works. It will help me get rid of these blind spots that I was just speaking of. But the key to this is that the key that prepares us for heaven also prepares us for living here on earth. See, we don't naturally think that way. We think, okay, I'm saved. Now I need to go about and do my good works, and that's up to me. And I can say that the thing that prepares us for heaven prepares us for our life here on earth. Or to be more specific, specific, the key to experiencing forgiveness from God is the same key for experiencing fruitfulness in life. Or another way of saying it, the key to pardon for my sins is the same key that unlocks the power in me to love people. Loving people can be really tough because I can see myself before God in my eyes. I can see myself loving God and receiving God's love, but I can't stand this jerk that I work with. It's easy to do, right? Because people can get on your last nerve. But when we walk in the full experience of the love of God, and are a reflection of his agape love, that we then have the power to love people. In other words, again, another way of saying it, a little more theological, I guess, would be the key that unlocks justification between us and God is the same key that unlocks sanctification. principle is is that God is magnified in us the the glory of God is most magnified in me when I am most satisfied with God when I have humbly 
come before him and I receive him. Then his majesty is revealed in me. And the reason all this matters as we go forward is that we can discern what actually has justified us before God. Because there are many people who would believe that I am justified before God by good works. But it is by grace we are saved. By grace you are saved. If you read Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, it talks about all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. That salvation is a free gift from God, and not of works, lest any man would boast. I cannot boast of my salvation. I may have trusted in something else. And I read this, and many times, and the reason this is so precious to me is because I was raised believing that you had to be a good person to be saved. And that's how you were saved. And I even had someone that was very close to me that had been in church all his life. And we were discussing the lack of receiving Christ that someone had. And he said, but don't you think he lives a good life? And that stuck with me in thinking that, yes, but what if he lives a good life and dies and does not go to heaven? What could be worse than that? It's because the way I was taught that you had to earn your salvation that was a great stumbling block in my life for many years. But the key to our justification is the grace of God. The key to our sanctification, we can misunderstand that also because I can say, okay, I'm saved by grace through faith. But now it is up to me to perform and to make myself be a better person. God is not interested in our behavior modification, but he is interested in us being transformed, changed into a new creation by the renewing of our minds through his word. You see, if I have not been changed, I can only modify my behavior. And the old, the old uh, parable that J. Vernon McGee said, you know, like the prodigal son lived in a pig pen, but because he was a son, he could never be happy there. Because he was not a pig, he couldn't live in the pig pen and be happy. Likewise, if you took the pig out of the pig pen and cleaned him up and gave him a nice house to live in, he wouldn't be happy. You could dress him up in good clothes. He's going to head right back to the pig pen the first chance he gets. Our sanctification and our justification are obtained both by the grace of God. So let's look at this Christian principle here that we have. It's a biblical principle of God my exceeding joy. It says, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And this is a Christian principle that we have here that we talked about that when we are most satisfied in the Lord and, and we are most joyful in the Lord is when his majesty is made great in us by our satisfaction with him. So let's use a practical example. This year, 2020, it marks a couple milestones in my life as I look back. There's two anniversaries in 2020. 51 years since I was born again this year. 51 years I've been a Christian. Certainly didn't live like one for 51 years. But 51 years I've been a Christian. That's a milestone in my life. Last Sunday, one week before now, was 45 years since I had been married. For my 45th wedding anniversary was last Sunday. 
The first thing happened was in Louisville, Kentucky, when I was born again, 51 years ago, at church camp. And I remember Pastor Larry Friels, we were in the dormitory and we knelt and we prayed. I was 13 years old, or 14 years old. The second milestone in my life, 45 years ago, in Highland Heights, Kentucky, at the Nazarene Church, that my wife and I got married. But I think looking at these things, we can shed a little bit of light on this principle that I, I put forth as an illustration from my marriage. Let's read this verse one more time, verse 4, Psalm 43, verse 4. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. The exceeding joy in this context is more than just praising God with our vocal cords and lips. It's like every Sunday morning we do worship songs and we sing. And we can become very comfortable with this and memorize the songs. But they can mean nothing to us as we sing the songs over and over and over and Matthew 15, 8, 8 and 9, Jesus was speaking. He said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. They're saying all the right things, but their heart is far from me. Worship that is only words and not of the heart. It's vain. It's meaningless. If the heart does not find God to be its exceeding joy, anything that comes out of the mouth does not mean anything. We could form a habit of singing, going through the motions of praising God. And many times the music is pleasing to the ears. I find worship worship music like Hillsong, very, very good music to listen to, and I enjoy listening to it. But do I hear and experience the actual worship, or is it merely a vain remembrance? But on the other side of that, we go through the devastation of repentance, the realization that we need a Savior. As the conviction of the Holy Spirit hits my heart, and I see that Jesus, that God for love, so that God so loved the world, and He so loved me that He gave His only Son, that in Jesus Christ He gave His life willfully, and I'm devastated and broken by this. And it's a wonderful thing. Because now I can prize him and I can praise him because he is the joy of my life. Because you see, my happiness and joy reveals my treasure. Now I'm going to use, I said I would use my marriage to actually show how this can, it works practically and it will make this much clearer. Because so far you may think, okay. This doesn't really make any sense. But think of this, and young men especially. Listen close to this. It can save your life, okay, once you're married. Okay. So let's say that this is my 45th anniversary, as last Sunday was. And so, and I didn't do this, by the way, so I, I'm nobody to really lecture on this. But let's say, so I go home, and I have 50 red roses behind my back for my wife for our anniversary. And I've planned a nice evening together with my wife. So I get home and I walk in, honey, I'm home. And I hand her these roses, okay? And she goes, oh, Paul, these are just beautiful. Thank you so much. You shouldn't have gone to all this trouble. And uh, I say, well, I have some really nice plans for our evening. You know, we're going to go out to dinner. We're going to have a wonderful evening together. Oh, you shouldn't have, you know, why would you do something so great, you know? And I would say, well, you know what? I read the marriage manual, and this is what a good husband should do, you know. So, um, 
And I can tell you right now, don't ever do that, okay? That's the wrong answer. That is, the action was the same, but the heart was not so good, okay? So let's, let's rewind this, okay? It was that out of duty, right? My duty as a good husband, because I wanted to, just wanted to be a good husband, okay, I'll do this, but my heart was really not there. I wanted to be a good husband, but for what reason? So let's rewind it and let's try this again, right? Okay, so I walk in and I have the 50 red roses. And the response is the same, oh, this is great, this is wonderful. Why would you go to all this trouble? And I say, well, I couldn't help myself. It makes me so happy to get flowers for you. And I want you to go put on something nice and I'm going to take you to dinner because nothing would make me happier than spending the evening, this whole evening with just you. Now, how will she take that? Will she say, oh, so it makes you happy to get me flowers and it makes you happy to spend this thing. Aren't you just being selfish? Well, no, she's not going to respond that way because she knows that it makes me happy because she is my greatest joy. You see the difference? One out of duty, but one because she is my greatest joy. And because she is my greatest joy, it makes me very happy to serve her. I am fulfilled in service to my wife because she is truly my greatest joy. And you see now that the key, the key to the joy of the Lord is when and to truly serving him in that relationship is when he is my greatest joy, as the psalmist said, then my praise becomes something other than a song that I've memorized. It becomes something more than a duty that I do, a form that we have. It becomes something more than just a method of receiving approval from God. You see, the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I become strengthened to love others. I receive capacity to love those who are unlovely. I receive capacity to live a life that is a sanctified life. I receive a capacity in the joy of the Lord to live a overcoming a fruitful and blessed life, regardless of the external circumstances. You see, naturally, I say, okay, I am unhappy because of this bad situation in my life or that bad situation in my life that I cannot have joy. But I will tell you from personal experience that typically, because I have no joy in my life, I've gotten myself into this negative situation and that negative situation, and I have gotten things reversed because that is the way that Satan uses my natural mind to keep me in defeat. The key to our joy in the Lord is recognizing that we are justified by God's grace and through faith and that alone. That I didn't do anything to deserve these blessings that I have in the Lord, but that I have received blessings from God even when I was dead in my trespasses and sin, even when I could not respond, that he reached and gave me that opportunity to receive him as the blessing in my life.
I always think of that painting at the, on the Sistine Chapel, the Michelangelo painting, where man is laying there, unable to move, and the hand of God reaching down and touching and imparting life to him. We have free will to receive that touch from God or to reject it. But once we do, our lives are never the same. When we recognize his love, his grace for us, that everything in our lives, the blessings in our lives, our salvation, our sanctification, are all, and our joy is all because of his love and his grace, his mercy for us.